Okay, hi everyone. Uh, hopefully this is working. I'm Richard Purdy. Um, I'm the Okta Project Architect and a fellow at the Linux Foundation. And I'm here to answer some questions. I don't quite see any yet. Okay, well, I've got a message. At least, at least things seem to be live and seem to be working. So that's so far so good. So yeah, if anybody has any questions, please uh, please ask away. So I'm being asked, how did I first get involved in open source? Um, my history was, uh, I actually bought a, um, a, a small device, a Sharps Aris, and um, it came with Linux on it, but it was a 2.4 kernel and it had certain limitations. So I started messing around with that. Um, that led me to build systems um, to, to what was build root at the time. And then this project called Open Embedded and uh, everything grew from there. So that's that's how I got started. So I'm being asked what the plan is for for the uh, Yocto project LTS releases. Um, it's being asked how long are the releases going to, how often are the releases going to be marked as an LTS? Our current plan is probably every two years. So 3.1 was released uh, six months ago, so that will be our LTS uh, release uh, for the next couple of years. That's the plan right now. Um, and it's great to see some of the traction that we're getting around the, the, the LTS release. It seems very popular with people, so that's good. So a uh, question there about reproducible builds. Um, what's the current status of those in the Octa project? Um, We've made a lot of good progress. So we now have automated reproducible uh, reproducibility testing on the auto builder. Um, I think that's currently working around core image Sato. So everything up to um, core image Sato is now basically 100% reprodu reproducible. Uh, there's a lot of different definitions about what reproducible means. For us, that means that it doesn't matter which distro you build it on or um, the path that you build it in. It will always give exactly the same um, the same uh, end results, and we're testing that across multiple different distros at this point. So it's quite a, a sort of an extensive test, and so everything up to core image Sato is the answer for that. I'm being asked about the the tenth anniversary of uh, Yocta project. Um, there's actually a presentation about that. Uh, Jeffro and, uh, and Nico, our past and present community managers, are giving a, a presentation, and I think I even feature in the uh, in that video. Um, so I'd, I'd say go and watch the video, go, go and watch that presentation. I think, um, I mean, for me, it's amazing that the project's been going ten years. It's great to see some of the the places that it's gone and so on. But uh, I'm yeah. It, I, it, I didn't think ten years ago we'd you know be sitting here talking about the tenth year anniversary, so that's it's it's cool. Uh, biggest features coming to Yocto soon? I don't know. Why don't why don't you tell us what what fe what features do people want to see? Um, I mean, we've seen some sort of some really significant changes more recently. The, the latest ones were the hash equivalents and the reproducibility. Um, you know, in the past we've had the recipe specific sys roots and um, even the layer model was a was a new and big sort of divisive change at one point. So uh, there's been a lot of those over the last 10 years. It's hard to predict the future. It depends what people work on. But um, I, I, I don't think we're done yet. I think there's a lot of good ideas out there. I'm just reading the question. Um, so, so there's a question about whether there's any plans to uh, to work out the application order of variables. Um, there's lots of ideas to do with that. Um, I know that I did put a proposal out recently about default values. 
Um, there was a <laughs> number of flaws pointed out in that proposal, I think. Um, the trouble is, as soon as we start changing anything, it breaks compatibility, and that does that does cause a lot of problems. And one of the big advantages of what we have today is the flexibility and the power that it's that, that, that very, those variables give you. So it's a really good question. I'm certainly open to creative ideas on how we could improve things, uh, but there is now quite a bit of legacy. There's ten, 10 years of legacy for just the Okta project alone. Um, so I've, I've got mixed feelings on that. Even yesterday, I was just messing around seeing if I could actually try and make the parsing a little bit faster because um, I had some ideas about where we might be losing some speed with that, but it turns out it's only worth about 10 to 15 percent, not, not the huge gains I was hoping for. So it's certainly something we've, we've got an open mind to, but it's also very hard to do given the legacy situation. So um, yeah, it's, if you've got ideas, please talk to us. Um, my opinions about uh, GUIs such as Toaster, is it really useful? I'm actually a little disappointed that we haven't had more GUIs over, over the last 10 years. That's something that I would like to see. I mean, Toaster, um, as a, you know, from a development standpoint, has stalled a bit, a bit more recently, and it doesn't have the sort of the, the critical mass of developers behind it that I think it needs to move forward and to, to gain new features. It's still working, it's still there, it's still being looked after, but it's not really developing. Um, so I, I would love to see uh, more sort of GUIs um, built around um, that built around the interfaces that Bitbake provides, or even on new interfaces. Um, so yeah, it's, it's one of the things I, I, I think there's a lot of potential there for development. It's very difficult because the project is so uh, so wide encompassing to build a, a user interface around some of that functionality. But when you get it right, I think it's very rewarding. So yeah, if, if I, I like Toaster. I'd like to see it grow more. Um, I think we do need to improve some of the APIs we've got to Bitbake itself, but we have tried to create those. We've tried to create things like the, the tinfoil APIs so you can access these things. So I'd like to see more GUIs such as Toaster, but I'd also like to see more um, even command line interact type utilities directly integrate, integrate directly um, communicating with Bitbake over likes of tinfoil. Trying to, it's difficult to keep up with the questions as they come in. Um, so, about arguments to convince colleagues to migrate from uh, migrate to the Octa project away from a Debian-based OS, concerns about reliability and test overhead. Um, it, it's a good question. I mean. Debian is good for some things. The Octo project is also is, is good for other things. It depends often what it is you're trying to do. Um, if you've got sort of, to, if you need to do any kind of license sort of auditing or disclosure, then the Octo project is one of the best systems out there for that. You can't really do that from a Debian standpoint. Um, I think our LTS story is a lot is a lot stronger now with some of the developments we had with the project. Um, from a reliability standpoint. I think once you have your Octo project working, the way the, system, the, the technology we built into the system means once it's working, it should stay working. It's designed to be reproducible. It's designed to sort of, um, you know, give you exactly the same build result if you try and rebuild something in five years, 10 years time or something like that. So I think from a reliability standpoint, it's, it's robust. It does need a little bit of upfront overhead for setup, but um, once you've got there, then it's, uh, it's phenomenal for, being able to um, handle things like security fixes. If a security problem emerges and you need to patch the source code and then re-release it for some old binaries or whatever that your company shipped in the product, um, I think it's you're kind of taking control of your own destiny with something like Yocta Project, whereas with Debian, you're reliant on other people. Uh, how small can a, of a root of us can Pocky Tiny make? Um, that's a good question. There was a patch on the uh, mailing list I noticed came in over the weekend that um, improves the uh, the size of Tiny by I think it was saying thirteen you know thirteen percent reduction. Um, it's it's always a feature trade off. If you want to get rid of everything from your root FS, you can have a really really small root FS. So you, you've really got to define what feature set of functionality that you want. 
But if you can configure it, um, if you can configure Linux down to that size, the Octo project can build it because we're a build tool. So it really comes down to which components you're using and the you know what functionality you want within that. Um, so I mean, if if you can you, you can configure it down to something that's more flash size or or EMMC. Um, So there's a question about the LTS release model. Is that focusing on securing Pocky or does it focus on the build system? It's very much about making sure that um, the OS itself is, is secure as well. So at, we're base, at the moment, LTS is focusing on the components in Open Embedded Core, but if there was a significant security issue, you know, the layers, that would be something that we'd probably look at as well. And it's not just about the build system, it's about making sure that the components that we're building in the core are staying, um, you know, staying secure, we're staying up to date. We're, so we're monitoring CVEs, we're monitoring issues that get reported to us. But the LTS is, whilst we've got a maintainer there who's putting through test cycles, making releases and, and pulling everything together, we do require some, you know, help from the community in, in submissions to that. And I think going forward, we're going to be, um, I, I think we're in a good position for Open Embedded Core. Beyond that, um, I think there are things we can do there, and I, um, but it will need you know, community help in making sure we get the patches, we get the issues reported to us and so on. So it, it really is going to be partly about the community collaborating together, but we put all of the pieces in place to allow us to do that. It's, it's much like Linux kernel, you know, the stable releases are going to be what people make of them. Um, so help us with that. But it is definitely not just focused on the build system, it's focused beyond that in the components as well. Um, so when we added recipe specific sysroots, there was talk about task specific sysroots. Um, task specific sysroots was a realization when we added recipe specific sysroots that um, things do change based on the tasks. The trouble is that some sysroots do, can't need to be need to be preserved between tasks, so you can't change the sysroots from under the system between configure and compile, for example. That just will not work. Um, whether you whether there's a packaging sysroot and a sort of a compilation sysroot, that might be something we could look at in the future. There's there's nothing particularly hard coded in the system that says they have to be recipe specific, but that's certainly what uh, what made most sense at that time to implement. In the future, we might do something like making um, host tools be recipe specific. So currently, the host tools are syst are, are, are um, build wide, and we might make those potentially recipe specific or something like that. Um, we haven't found too many problems with task specific problems right now, but it's something we certainly could think about in future. There's nothing uh, hard coded in there related to that. Uh, so external tool chains, good or bad practice. Um, they probably have their uses and their places. Um, I don't particularly like them. I don't see that we really need them in most cases. I do understand why they exist, so I tend to ignore them, but some people have done a good job of integrating them. Um, <laughs> a bit of a Marmite issue, I think. Um, some people like them, some people don't. Um, but we, in, in general, we found people tend to move away from them um, because you can, in some ways, I'd like to see the external tool chains built as sort of locked uh, as a set of locked estate, for example, rather than some of the current external external tool chain models. But nobody's actually tried that yet. Um, but yeah, that they're a kind of a fact of life, the same as binaries and systems, really. Uh, can I explain the recent improvements made to sudo? Um, I can, I'm just trying to think how, how quickly I can do it. Um, uh, 
yeah, I, I think that was probably, we'll, we'll come back to that one perhaps if, if we've got time. Um, So there's a question about why there's no way to um, strap up BS, BSP in layers using, for example, repo or submodules. I think that was a contentious and slightly um, difficult decision we made early on in the project that we weren't going to mandate a way of doing that. And it has turned into a little bit of the Wild West with so many different ways of doing things. In some ways, that's the strength of the project. It means that people aren't locked into a particular way of doing things. But I think we've always wondered about creating some sort of setup tool that would help with that in some way. Um, it's, there's a list of future directions that was published uh, recently that the TSC had worked on, the Technical Steering Committee for the project. And that is one of the, the set of issues of one of those, um, uh, one of those topics in there. So if you want to find out more information about that, go and, go and have a look at that document and, and ask us on the mailing list. But it's, it's something I think we, we probably do need to address at some point. Um, that's probably one of those things in this next 10 year cycle, but um, it, it's, it's difficult because everybody has a very specific idea about what they want to do and how they want to do it. So it's by no means a simple, uh, a simple problem to address. So we're, we're left with the, with the, the pseudo question. So I'll, I'll try and quickly um, I'll try and give a, a quick overview of that. Um, the, the problem was that sudo assumes, one of the design assumptions in sudo is that it assumes all of the recipes can see, well, that, that, that particular, that sudo is responsible for the permissions of everything in the system. So if you go and modify some files behind the scenes, um, sudo can lose track of things and get quite upset that those files have changed without its knowledge. You can't really tell or couldn't really tell sudo just to, to focus on a specific directory. So the, the changes that we, we added were to allow sudo to focus on one specific location uh, and, and to ignore certain other paths. And that leads to the database being um, a lot cleaner because it's not trying to track files that we don't actually care about. Um, but that means that certain recipes needed to be changed and so on. So it was, it was a fairly late breaking problem. But the, the issue that we had was that sudo was tracking files which were then changing. Uh, so inode numbers, for example, uh, could be, a file could be created with a given inode. It could be deleted behind the scenes and then a new file created that reused that inode. And then sudo was confusing permissions across those files. So the changes we've made are to try and um, address that. Okay, so uh, I think I've only got a few minutes left, but I'll try my best to get through the, the rest of the questions that are here. Um, can I explain what I meant by locked S state? Um, this is where uh, instead of bit by calculating a particular hash for S state and then checking whether that hash exists in the S state, instead you just tell bit by that this particular task has this S state uh, hash value. And that's one of the ways in which the SDK can work. And uh, so there's a, a locked signatures file. It's a standard bit bit conf file. You just write some entries in there, and then it locks down the S state to that particular thing. So even if the underlying system changes from under it, it will use that particular artifact with that particular hash from the cache. Um, so it's used extensively, <laughs> no, no pun intended, it's used extensively in the extensible SDK. Um, but it, it has, it, it has uses outside of that as well that we haven't really capitalized on yet. Okay, is, is there a way to overlay a layer.com file with a BB pen like a recipe? Not really, no. Um, we've tried not to complicate things by adding a conf append files or something crazy like that. So I'm afraid not. There's no really easy way of doing that. You can pretty much do anything in anonymous Python, for example, but there's no mechanism like a BP append. And can I give some pros and cons of create, using Pocky directly versus creating a custom distro? Um, to be honest, most people want to create their own distro. Uh, it sounds a little bit crazy, but in our in, a, in the context of the Octo project, 
creating your own distro comp file is fine. Um, Pocky is a good default. You could inherit from it and then just build on top of it. That's what Pocky Tiny does um, and Pocky Alt Config. Um, so there's examples of those there. Um, but you can just do that, you know, create your own distro and then just have nothing in it. You can just inherit from Pocky. And then if you ever need to change anything, you have the place and the mechanism to do that. So my advice is that, yeah, Pocky is great as a reference distro, but inherit from it or create your own. It's what the system's designed to be able to handle. And is there a reason that the Bitbait user manual is not part of the mega manual? Um, we're busy changing all the documentation right now over from Docbook to Sphinx. So I think that the Bitbait manual will be included in the new equivalent of the mega manual in the, the new setup. Uh, if it's not, remind us and we'll see what we can do about that. But yeah, the, the move to Sphinx means that the documentation is a lot more accessible um, for people to make changes to and develop. So hopefully that should be one of the advantages of it. I think I'm probably running out of time. I'm not entirely sure how I see that in here, but um, I, I guess to, to wrap up, what I will say is that if anybody does have any more questions, I've not quite got to some of the ones at the end there. Uh, please do find me in the, the conference system, um, and I'm uh, quite happy to try and answer those. And uh, you know, so please come find me. Um, of, of, there is a um, the Octo Project Slack channel that's accessible through the booth. Uh, come find us there. You'll find uh, people who can answer a lot of questions about the project from there. But yeah, thanks everyone.